Hello. It's me again, Dr. O'Connor. Today we're going to talk about epithelial tissue. We're going to start with simple squamous epithelium. When we look at simple squamous epithelium, understand that the word simple refers to the fact that there's only one layer of cells. Squamous refers to the shape of the cell, which is flat. So we're going to take a look at some simple squamous epithelium. As you look at the screen, you're going to see a simple squamous epithelial cell right over here. And you can see how flat the cell is. You can see that the nucleus of the cell is somewhat oval because, again, the cell is flat in shape. This particular slide is from the lung tissue, and these are the alveoli of the lungs. So again, here's our example of a simple squamous epithelial cell, a flat cell with a somewhat elongated or oval-shaped nucleus. These cells are specifically designed for simple diffusion and filtration. Again, we find them lining blood vessels, lining lymphatic vessels in the alveoli of the lungs, and they make up capillary walls. Let's take a look at the next slide. The next slide that we're going to look at today is that of simple cuboidal epithelium. Simple cuboidal epithelium consists of, again, a single layer of cube-shaped cells. These cells have a round nucleus that is centrally located within the cell. These cells are designed for secretion, absorption, and reabsorption, and we can find simple cuboidal epithelium covering ovaries lining kidney tubules. It's also found in the ducts of certain glands, like the pancreas, the liver, the salivary glands, as well as in the thyroid gland. So let's take a look at these simple cuboidal cells right now. You're going to see them come up on the screen in front of me again. Okay. Now, if you look right over here, you'll see those simple cuboidal cells. Remember that simple cuboidal epithelium, as with all epithelium, lies on a thin, non-living layer called the basement membrane. Now here's the basement membrane right here on this slide. And it's actually between two layers of simple cuboidal epithelium. Okay. So, let's move on to the next slide. Now we're going to talk about simple columnar epithelium. Simple columnar epithelium consists of a single layer of elongated cells whose nuclei are located very close to the basement membrane. Sometimes, simple columnar epithelial cells have cilia extending from the free surface of the cell itself. Cilia, as you remember, are cytoplasmic extensions that have microtubules inside to help reinforce their structure. Cilia are responsible for moving things across the surface of the cell. We find ciliated simple columnar epithelium in the fallopian tubes, which are also known as the uterine tubes. We also find non-ciliated simple columnar epithelium in the stomach, the small and large intestines, as well as within the uterus. Because simple columnar epithelium is somewhat thick, it not only helps for secretion and absorption, but also for protection. Oftentimes, within simple columnar epithelium, you will find certain cells embedded in between the epithelial cells. These cells are called goblet cells. Goblet cells are really fat and clear because they secrete mucus. Mucus is often used to help either trap foreign particles so they can be moved out of our body, or sometimes mucus is used as a protective mechanism as it is in the digestive system. So let's take a look at our simple epithelial cells. Now as you look at this slide, we'll see 
a layer of elongated cells and all these little red dots are the red nuclei along the basement membrane. From the red nuclei you'll see extending inward towards the free surface blue cytoplasm. The goblet cells that I spoke of earlier are the clear cells and there's one let's see if I can use this finger here one right here okay that's a clear goblet cell and also where I am I'm gonna move over this way so you can see some other goblet cells right over here let's see there we go okay here are some more goblet cells embedded within the simple columnar epithelium let's look at the next slide next we're going to talk about pseudostratified columnar epithelium pseudostratified means false layers so where it appears that there are layers within these cells because the nuclei are located at different levels each and every cell makes contact with the basement membrane and that's why even though it looks like they're layers they truly are not so we call it pseudostratified columnar epithelium you can find pseudostratified columnar epithelium lining the respiratory passageways and that's all you need to know for your test let's go ahead and take a look at this next when we look at the slide you can see that the nuclei are located at different levels from the basement membrane which is right here here's your basement membrane and the nuclei even though they're located at different levels remember every cell makes contact with the basement membrane that's why we get the word pseudostratified if you look at the free surface of the cells right here okay you'll notice that there are cilia on the surfaces of the cells when mucus is produced because again there are goblet cells embedded within the epithelial tissue and so as mucus is produced foreign particles can be trapped and the cilia will help to sweep the surface of the cell clearing and cleaning away any foreign particles that are trapped in the mucus in the lining of the lower respiratory tract our cilia actually sweep upward so that the mucus goes to our throat so we can swallow it and when microorganisms hit the digestive juice they tend to be dissolved in the upper respiratory tract our cilia actually sweep mucus downward again to our throat for the same reason let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide the next slide that we have is a slide of stratified squamous epithelium remember that the word stratified means layers squamous refers to the shape of the cell being flat when we look at stratified squamous epithelium what you're going to notice is that the cells closest to other hand here we go closest to the basement membrane are somewhat cuboidal in shape and that's because the cells closest to the basement membrane are undergoing rapid mitosis which is cell division you can tell that these are cuboidal in shape because of the round nucleus as cells get older they get pushed toward the free surface where they flatten out and now you can see that the shape of the nucleus is more elongated as the cell flattens out as well we find stratified squamous epithelium in the skin in the skin as the layers of cells get pushed toward the free surface they accumulate a protein called keratin which helps keep the skin tough and waterproof the outer layers of the skin in the epidermis are actually dead however we also have stratified squamous epithelium in the oral cavity the throat the esophagus the anal canal and the vaginal canal in these areas inside the body where it's moist the cells are actually alive all the way to the free surface I like to call stratified squamous epithelium as tissue that's involved in high traffic areas or areas of high wear and tear let's move on to the next slide next we're going to talk about stratified cuboidal epithelium stratified cuboidal epithelium consists of layers of cuboidal shaped cells that are only usually about two to three layers thick stratified cuboidal epithelium can be found lining the ducts of mammary glands sweat glands salivary glands as well as in the pancreas 
Another place that you'll find stratified cuboidal epithelium is where sex cells are produced. Our eggs, if you're a female, are produced in the follicles that are in the ovaries. And follicles are lined with stratified cuboidal epithelium. In the male, within the testes, we have special structures called the seminiferous tubules. The seminiferous tubules are also lined with stratified cuboidal epithelium. We'll take a look at this now. In fact, what you're going to look at is the testes. Let's see if I can move myself over here. What you're looking at right here is the actual lining of the seminiferous tubule. And when you look at the lining, you'll be able to see the nuclei of the stratified cuboidal cells. There's one here and one over here. Okay, so I've got two to three layers of cuboidal shaped cells. Remember that when we look at tissue and cells, the nucleus tends to stain darker, a lot darker than the cytoplasm. So sometimes it's easier to look for the nucleus as it is in this case. So this is stratified cuboidal epithelium, again, found where sex cells are produced in ovarian follicles, in the seminiferous tubules, also found in the ducts of the mammary glands, as well as the pancreas, salivary glands, and sweat glands. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. The next slide we're going to be talking about is a slide of connective tissue. In conjunction with our lab, we're moving on from epithelial tissue to connective tissue. The first slide of connective tissue that we're going to be looking at today is a slide of areolar or loose connective tissue. Remember that areolar or loose connective tissue binds skin to underlying organs. It also fills spaces between muscles and is found underlying most epithelial tissue. Loose or areolar connective tissue has an appearance that's kind of every which way but loose. When you look at the slide, you can actually see different fibers that are found in connective tissue as well as some fibroblasts. Again, there's no rhyme or reason to loose or areolar connective tissue. It just has a very loose appearance. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. The next slide that we're going to be looking at today is a slide of dense regular connective tissue. Now, dense connective tissue comes in two forms. We have regular dense connective tissue and irregular dense connective tissue. Irregular dense connective tissue can be found in the dermis, which is the middle layer of the skin. Regular dense connective tissue is the type of connective tissue found in tendons and ligaments. Remember, tendons attach muscle to bone, ligaments attach bones to bones. Let's go ahead and take a look at regular dense connective tissue. When we look at the slide, you can see that there's a very wavy appearance of collagen fibers. It's almost like somebody took a paintbrush and just waved the paint in that fashion. You can also see some fibroblasts. Now remember that the regular dense connective tissue that makes up tendons and ligaments doesn't have a good blood supply. So if you ever have damage to a ligament or to a tendon, that damage is not going to heal very easily. So this is regular dense connective tissue. Let's go ahead, we'll move on to the next slide. The next tissue we're going to discuss is adipose tissue. Adipose tissue can be found in a lot of places in the body. We can find adipose tissue behind the eyeballs, on the surface of the heart. We can find it around the kidneys. It is found in certain abdominal membranes like the greater omentum. It also cushions some joints. It is found beneath the skin and it also fills spaces between muscles. So let's go ahead and we'll take a look at adipose tissue. When we look at this slide, what you'll notice is that you can see a lot of clear cells because these cells are adipocytes and they're basically filled up with globules of fat. And fat doesn't really take up stain, so the cells look very, very clear. You can see a lot of cell membranes. As the cells fill up with fat, the nucleus gets pushed to the side so far that sometimes it almost looks like it's been pushed clear out of the cell. 
So this is adipose tissue. Again, the cells are called adipocytes. Adipose tissue serves not only to cushion some joints and certain organs, but it also helps to insulate us so that we can retain heat, and it also helps to store energy. Let's take a look at the next slide. The slide you're looking at now is a slide of hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage consists of cells called chondrocytes. Remember the word chondro means cartilage. And the chondrocytes are located in little lakes called lacunae. And those are just little spaces where these cells reside. Hyaline cartilage is what makes up the soft part of the end of your nose. It also makes up the rings of your respiratory tract. Hyaline cartilage also makes up some of the larger portions of your larynx, like the thyroid cartilage, as well as the cricoid cartilage, and other parts of the respiratory system that we haven't yet learned about. Hyaline cartilage is responsible for making up the model of the embryonic skeleton, and it also is found on the ends of bones of many joints. So if you've ever seen people eat the ends of chicken bones, that's basically what they're eating, hyaline cartilage. We can also find hyaline cartilage between the ribs and the sternum. Now when you look at hyaline cartilage, again, one of the things to note is that not only do the cells reside in lacunae, but you'll see that the matrix of this particular connective tissue has a very smooth appearance. When you look at actual hyaline cartilage, it has the appearance of white glass. So this is hyaline cartilage. Remember, hyaline cartilage is one of the three types of specialized connective tissue. We have blood, bone, and cartilage. Now, we're going to look at elastic cartilage next so you can tell the difference between the two. Let's go on to the next slide. The slide that we're looking at right now is a slide of elastic cartilage. The main difference between elastic cartilage and hyaline cartilage is that within the matrix of elastic cartilage, you can find tiny little elastic fibers. And if you look carefully, you should see very fine little threads of elastic fibers, again, located around the chondrocytes in the matrix of elastic cartilage. Now, elastic cartilage is found in our ears, which is what makes them flexible, and also in a part of the larynx where we have a structure called the epiglottis. The epiglottis has to be flexible so that it can close partially over the trachea when you swallow food or liquid so that those components don't go down into your airways, but rather get directed backward toward the esophagus. So again, this is elastic cartilage. And again, the difference between elastic cartilage and hyaline cartilage is these thin, tiny elastic fibers that are found within the matrix. Let's go on to the next slide. We're going to talk about osseous tissue next. Osseous tissue consists of cells called osteocytes, which, like chondrocytes, also live in spaces called lacunae. When we look at osseous tissue, understand that there are certain parts of bone that are arranged very, very specifically. And they're arranged in structures called osteons. An osteon looks very similar to the trunk of a tree. Within an osteon, you have a central canal, which provides a passageway for blood vessels and nerves. Around each central canal, which by the way is sometimes called a Haversian canal, that's capital H-A-V-E-R-S-I-A-N, arranged around each central or Haversian canal in concentric rings are the actual osteocytes. Let me see if I can point to an osteocyte. Here's one here. There's another one down here. Now the rings around 
the central canal, I'm sorry, I'm doing this upside down and backwards, <laughs> the rings around the central canal, like rings of a tree, are referred to as lamellae. And the osteocytes are able to communicate with one another even though they get farther and farther away from the central canal because their cytoplasm extends through tiny little canals. And you might be able to see them radiating away between the lamellae. Okay? Those little canals are called canaliculi. As the cytoplasm of each osteocyte extends through the canaliculi, the cytoplasm forms intercellular junctions called gap junctions. And we discussed these earlier. Remember, a gap junction is kind of like an open doorway between the cytoplasm of one cell and the cytoplasm of another cell. So you have a very free method of communication between cells. That allows for oxygen and nutrients to diffuse between the cells so that even as cells get farther away from the blood supply in the central canal, they still have very good access to oxygen and nutrients and also can get rid of waste simply by diffusion. Remember that bone is one of three types of specialized connective tissue. We have blood, bone, and cartilage. Let's go ahead, we'll move on to the next slide. The next slide we're going to look at is a slide of blood tissue. Now, blood has a liquid matrix called plasma. When we look at blood, we're going to see the formed elements that are within blood. That includes red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. As we look at this slide, you can see the red blood cells throughout your field of, of view. I can't speak today, excuse me. We've also got some white blood cells here. And there are many different types of white blood cells, but we're not gonna learn about those just yet. That's going to be in the chapter that's designated specifically for blood, which is chapter 14 in your book. You can also see some platelets, these tiny little purple dots within your field of view right here are platelets. Now, platelets are actually fragments of cells, and believe it or not, they're actually alive. But again, we'll learn a lot more about this when we get to chapter 14 in your book. So this concludes blood, which is the last of our specialized types of connective tissue. Don't forget, connective tissue consists of two different categories. We have what we call connective tissue proper, which includes areolar connective tissue, dense connective tissue, adipose tissue, reticular connective tissue, and elastic connective tissue. And then we have the three specialized types of connective tissue, blood, bone, and cartilage. Even though we don't have slides of all of the different types of epithelial tissue and connective tissues, you are still responsible for understanding where you would find those different types of tissues within the body. Let's go ahead, we're gonna look at some more slides. The next slide that we're going to look at is muscle. Remember, we've got four different types of tissue within the body. We have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. So muscle's next on the list. Let's go ahead, we'll take a look at our first slide. The slide we're going to view next is a slide of scalable muscle tissue. Remember that muscle tissue exists in three different types. We've got smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. Skeletal muscle is muscle that's found attached to bones, and when we look at skeletal muscle, one of the things that you're going to see is the fact that within the muscle fibers, you will find striations running perpendicular to the length of the skeletal muscle fiber. Remember that skeletal muscle is voluntary, so it requires conscious thought. It also is multinucleated, and I don't know that I can get a good picture of that on the slide for you. I apologize for that. 
but there is more than one nucleus in a skeletal muscle fiber. And again, you can see the striations a lot more clearly as they run perpendicular to the length of the fiber. The striations occur because of very regular patterns of proteins called actinomycin, which again, we're gonna learn a little bit more about when we get to that specific chapter in our book. So this is skeletal muscle tissue. Remember, it's striated, voluntary, and multinucleated. This is the only one of the three types of muscle tissue that actually has more than one nucleus. We'll go ahead and look at cardiac muscle tissue next. This slide is the slide of cardiac muscle tissue. Cardiac muscle tissue exists only in the heart. And cardiac muscle tissue is also striated. However, it is involuntary. So when we look at cardiac muscle tissue, what you're going to see is that cardiac muscle tissue has special intercellular junctions called intercalated discs. And we can actually see an intercalated disc here. And I think you can see another one, sorry, up here. OK, see this little line running perpendicular across the muscle fiber? OK, so cardiac muscle is involuntary, it's striated, and it consists of, or it has, special intercellular junctions called intercalated discs. The intercalated discs help cardiac muscle spread electrical impulses much more rapidly through the muscle tissue. Another interesting feature about cardiac muscle tissue is that it bifurcates. And I'm going to move over to this side perhaps showing you some bifurcations or branches of cardiac muscle. You can see a branch right down here. And I believe you can see one if we go up further. There's a branch as well. So even though cardiac muscle, like skeletal muscle, is striated, it bifurcates or branches, it is involuntary, and it has special intercellular junctions called intercal intercalated discs. Let's go on to smooth muscle. Smooth muscle, like cardiac muscle, is involuntary. But unlike cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle, smooth muscle lacks striations. It is also mononucleated, which means it's got one nucleus. Smooth muscle fibers tend to be shorter than skeletal muscle fibers. They're elongated with tapering ends. Now, when we look at the slide, remember that the cytoplasm of a cell doesn't stain very dark. Usually, the nucleus picks up more stain. So as we look at these cells, these muscle fibers, you can see the smooth muscle fiber nuclei that are also somewhat elongated. Now, smooth muscle can be found in the walls of hollow organs, including blood vessels, places like your stomach, your intestines, the uterus, the urinary bladder the ureters, just to name a few. And what you're looking at here are actually smooth muscle fibers that are part of an artery. Remember, these are involuntary, so they require no conscious thought whatsoever, which is a good thing, because if you think of where smooth muscle is located, you wouldn't want to have to think, OK, intestines squeeze, squeeze, heart beat, beat. You know, that would take up too much effort. So again, these are smooth muscle fibers. And that concludes our muscle tissue. Lastly, we're going to look at nervous tissue. Nervous tissue consists of basic cells called neurons and supporting cells called neuroglial cells. Nervous tissue helps us respond to changes that occur externally as well as internally. And when we look at nervous tissue, you can see an actual neuron right here. A neuron consists of three main portions. The largest portion is the cell body. And extending from the cell body are specialized processes that are called dendrites. Both the cell body and dendrites are designed to receive incoming information. We we'll find only one process extending away from the cell body 
and that's called the axon. The axon is designed to transmit impulses away from the cell body. Now, a neuron can have more than one dendrite, but it will only have one axon. Around the neuron, you can see the supporting cells, the neuroglial cells. Now, there are different types of neuroglial cells, which you're not responsible for yet, but when we talk about nervous tissue, when we get to chapter 10, you'll learn more about those neuroglial cells and what their functions are. This concludes the slides of different types of tissue that you can find in the body. Remember, we have four different tissue types. We have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Even though you may not have been able to see all the different types of slides for each tissue, for those tissue types which a slide is not available, you are still responsible for knowing where you would find those tissues in the body. So please remember that for your test. Lastly, we're going to take a look at the different layers that are found in the epidermis. So let's go ahead and take a look at that slide. The outermost layer of the epidermis is called the stratum corneum. The stratum corneum consists of many layers of dead, flat cells. These epidermal cells contain a lot of keratin. Keratin is a protein that makes the cells not only hard, but waterproof. And having a waterproof layer on the surface of our bodies helps to retard moisture loss from within our cells. That way we don't dehydrate. Now, if we look at the stratum corneum, okay, you can see it's a very, very thick layer. And it extends very, very far all the way to the next layer of skin. The next layer of skin that you can see where my finger hopefully is pointing to on this slide is a bright red layer. This layer is called the stratum lucidum. The stratum lucidum consists of clear cells. Now the stratum lucidum is found only on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. Everywhere else on your body, you've only got four layers in your epidermis. Now just underneath the stratum lucidum is a layer of cells, maybe only about two to four cell layers thick. And this layer of cells just underneath the stratum lucidum is called your stratum granulosum. Deep to the stratum granulosum, we have more epithelial cells that extend deeper, and these cells are what make up the stratum spinosum. So if you can see this on here, right here, okay? Now the stratum spinosum, you'll notice that there are layers of the epidermis that kind of dip downward toward the dermis like spines, and that's where they get the term stratum spinosum from. Now, if we go, let me see if I can get this a little bit darker for you guys. Okay. I'm still trying to figure out the finger thing here. Here we go. If we go deep to the stratum spinosum, this is where we find our bottommost layer of cells, the stratum base cell. Now, the stratum base cell is where melanocytes live. Melanocytes are cells that produce melanin, which is what gives your skin pigment. The stratum base cell is also where we find rapid mitosis occurring. Remember, mitosis is cell division where we take parent cells and divide them into identical daughter cells. So we can see the stratum base cell close to the next layer of skin, which is the dermis. So again, we've got five layers to our epidermis. We're going to start at the topmost layer. This is the stratum corneum. Then we move to this bright red layer, the stratum lucidum. Just underneath the stratum lucidum is the stratum granulosum. 
And then let's see, we've got the stratum spinosum. And then finally, the stratum basal. Let me see if I can move over this way and point my finger in this direction. Here we go. The very bottom layer is